Okay, folks, I think it's about time for us to get started. Got a rather lengthy list here this morning to remind you of folks to pray for. Don't forget to pray for Nancy. Charlie tells me she's making excellent progress and he's having to control her. And I said, yeah. <laughs> Continue to pray for Nancy. Pray for uh, Ed Everett, Big Ed. He has uh, pneumonia and COVID, I understand. And so we need to pray for him. He's in the hospital out at the beaches. Winnie Perry sits right over here. Winnie is having some problems with circulation. Talked to Don last night. She seems to be doing okay. There's just some things that they haven't checked yet that they need to check and will be checking. And uh, she seems to be doing okay. Ramona uh, had tested positive for COVID. She's been in uh, isolated now about 10 days already. So pray for her and for her family, for Marilyn Kirkpatrick and her family during this time. And Alan Longnicker. Uh, Alan has been sick. I did not know that until uh, I was informed this morning. He's the one who sits here in the wheelchair. Uh, pray for Alan during this time. And then uh, you would want to know, because many of you have asked and have prayed for, my brother Frank died New Year's Day and uh, went very peacefully. I talked to his children, his sons, all three of them, and all of them gave the same report. He just went to sleep and didn't wake up. So he died very peacefully and very calmly, which is what they were praying for. He had been declining in health now, really declining the past year. So pray for his family. Now, I might have told you this. If I did, forgive me and just let me do it again. He, this is the first time I've ever encountered anyone in all my ministry who has given their body to science. First time. And it is so different. The memorial service will be when they get through using his body. They will then have a memorial service at the University of West Virginia where he gave his body to science. First time I've ever heard of that. His family had no time with him. Uh, they came within 15 minutes. And so uh, I, uh, I wish I knew when that service was going to be. I have no clue when it's going to be. And so just pray for Frank's family. Uh, three fine boys and a daughter. And just ask God's blessings to be upon them. He was a good brother. I believe that's the only ones I have. Did I miss someone? Yes. I just want to add Wayne and Sylvia Lee. Wayne and Sylvia Lee. Wayne and Sylvia Lee. Okay. All right. Now, we do not have a review sheet today, but I need to do just a little review with you to get us caught up to where we need to be in our study of John. Uh, when we understand that if I've calculated correctly, and it could be off some, but if I've calculated correctly, we're about two days or less, maybe one day, from the crucifixion of Jesus. So you know the rest of the chapters are going to be filled with the trials, 
the crucifixion, the death on the cross, the resurrection, the ascension back to the Father. So we're getting ready to get into those last crucial days in the life of Jesus. I mentioned to you, Jesus must have felt that his life was imploding. Uh, Judas, one of his disciples, had betrayed him. Uh, Peter had denied him. The rest of the disciples had run when they found out what was going to happen. They deserted him. He, he must have felt like his life was imploding. Now, I can say that because you have to remember that Jesus was both human and divine. He had all the symptoms of mankind, and he had all the symptoms of divinity. And so this God-man, Christ Jesus, uh, had to go through the agonies of the human experience. He came into this world to identify with us so that he could die to help us. His identity was with us, with you and with me. And that's difficult to grasp. It's the only time it will ever happen in all of human and divine history that there is a God-man, Christ Jesus. Now let's look at just a little bit of what we were talking about initially, and then we'll jump into the study as best we can for today. We've been talking about the vine, we've been talking about the branches, We've been talking about the branches that bear no fruit, what happens to them. And this matter of pruning, now I'm talking about something I've only read about. I've never pruned anything in my life except one ugly bush we had, and every time I pruned it, it came back bigger. So I just let it stay. And I, that's what happens with pruning. You prune things in order to improve growth and fruit. The fruit should get better and the growth should be more substantial. That's why you prune things. You get rid of the bad branches. The bad branches siphon off the energy, the sap that goes to the rest of the tree or the rest of the bush or the rest of the vine. So there is this idea, this concept, I have to prune in order to improve things for my life. Now, how do you prune the human experience? How do you prune your life? How do I prune my life? Let me just offer these suggestions. You may already have them in your notes. We are cleansed by the Word of God. I hope you heard Trevor Komatsu's sermon Sunday morning where he talked about uh, studying the Bible and reading the Bible and what the Word of God does in the human experience. He's absolutely on target. We cannot neglect the reading and the study of the Word of God and expect to produce good fruit. We just can't do it. It is a process that we go through. So we are cleansed by the Word of God. And we are cleansed trying to be made over in the image of Jesus Christ. We need to look more like Jesus tomorrow than we did today. We need to be more like Jesus tomorrow than we have been today. Whatever that might mean in your life and in my life, it has to do with the pruning and the cleansing process. And then the third thing is when we're talking about this idea of growth of the fruit and the better fruit and the stronger branches and the stronger fruit, uh, we must learn to compare ourselves to Jesus Christ rather than to each other. One of the big mistakes we make in the Christian life is we compare ourselves to other Christians. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not tragic. It's not sinful. It's just inadequate. It's just inadequate. You compare yourself to me, and you're going to come up short. You're going to come up short because I come up short. When I compare myself to you, the same thing happens. And there's a the twist in this that I have observed. Don't know that I've ever read it. Don't know that I've ever seen it in print anywhere. But there's a twist in this that I believe. When I get ready to compare myself spiritually to someone else, 
Do you know who normally I compare myself to? Not someone who's better than I am. It's someone who is not as good as I am. And we take on this attitude. Well, I'm not as bad as. And we name that person. But we don't compare ourselves to others. Whether it's a good comparison or a bad comparison. We don't compare ourselves that way. We compare ourselves to the standard of the scripture. Which is laid down in Jesus Christ the Son of God. That's our comparative moment. And then what do we mean when we talk about abiding and producing the fruit by abiding? If you're cut off from the branch, you're going to die. Pure and simple. If you're cut off from the vine, you're going to die. Pure and simple. So the abiding principle has to do I must maintain a connection with the power of God. I must obtain that resurrection, uh, that resurrection power that I must have if I am going to be a useful instrument in the kingdom of God. I must know how to stay connected. Now, I could give you a litany, litany of ways that you stay connected to the things of God here again. Reading the Word of God, I, I've been searching my brain and trying to come up with some ideas that would help us to read the Bible more than we've ever read it and to know and to memorize parts of it. I, I really am sold on the idea that you need to get into the Word of God if you're going to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You must get into the Word of God. Power is in the Word of God. Power is in the Scripture. Powers in the scripture. The Holy, the Comforter, who, has, who is the Holy Spirit, whom God hath sent to teach you all things. I must stay connected to that Holy Spirit that God has sent to teach me all things. I don't know all things yet. I don't even know what I don't know yet. But I do know this. There's a lot I know now that I didn't know 10 years ago. Because staying in the word of God helps you to grow and to find the energy and the strength and the fruit that comes. So this abiding, staying, dwelling with God in scripture. Now I don't know about you, but me. I encounter God more on the pages of Scripture than any other single way, including prayer. Because normally your prayer life is a lot shorter than your Bible reading life. Normally. And that's not always true. I've known some, I've known some folks who can pray for a long time and say very little. But when we understand what we're doing... When we're praying to the Heavenly Father and we know the Heavenly Father and we are praying, then we are beginning to prune and to grow and to maintain the connection through prayer. And then there is the witness, all of those things that involve the Christian life. If we do those with a standard of excellence, we're going to mature and become more what Jesus wants us to be. Now, the last thing in review is when we understand what's going on in our life, and we understand that an unattached branch bears no fruit. Now, I, I don't know how far you push this. I just have to confess. I don't know how far you push it. But folks, I don't understand a number of things about church and church life. I don't understand, number one, how you ever expect to grow in Christ without attending worship. I just don't understand how that's going to happen. How you come into contact with God through the worship of experience corporately with other believers in Christ. How important that is. We must come to the place that we know beyond the shadow of doubt 
that we must bear acceptable fruit to God. Now here's what happens in the downward spiral of those who do not worship God in spirit and in truth. Here's what happens. Everything about you is going to diminish in the Christian life. Everything about you. Leave prayer out of your life. Leave Bible reading out of your life. Leave worship out of your life. I could go on down the list. Leave stewardship out of your life. All of these things that matter to God, that matter to us. If we leave these out, we're going to spiral downward. Our gifts and our abilities will diminish in direct proportion to the use of that we make of them. Let me say that again. Every one of us is born with gifts and abilities. Every one of us. There is not a single mono-gifted person in this room this morning. Every person I know in this room today is multi-gifted. God gave you certain gifts to use in the body of Christ. Certain abilities to use in the body of Christ. And when he gives you these, if you don't use them, they lie dormant and they will not lie dormant for long. They will begin to diminish your life and diminish in your life. Second, they also, the same thing happens with the family and friends. When you have Christian friends and you cultivate that friendship, and we're going to talk about that in a little while, This becomes a very real thing to every one of us, this friendship and family. I can tell you, if you are a child of God, the family life is going to diminish in direct relationship to your negligence of the things of God. That only makes sense to me. I I was a would-be athlete in high school. I loved track, football, basketball. I was a wannabe. But I'll tell you what, if I had not worked hard at building muscle, endurance, well, I couldn't have won anything. I couldn't have won anything. You know, it's real easy when you get down to the goal line. If there's not a team on the other side, it's real easy to make a touchdown. It's just real easy. But it's that team that tries to get you not to make the touchdown that becomes the problem. Oh, listen, you can make as many touchdowns as you want as long as there's no opposition. As long as there's no one to counter, as long as there's no defense, you can make as many touchdowns as you want. Basketball, same way. If there's no one guarding you, it's easier to make a basket. So we must understand that everything diminishes in direct relationship to our negligence. Now, if it sounds like I'm preaching to you this morning, I am. This is a new year, and this is a time when we need to make up our minds. I'm going to do some things in 2021 that's going to make me a stronger, more vibrant, more viable believer in Jesus Christ in the world in which I live. I'm going to do it deliberately. I'm going to do it because God wants it to happen in my life. And then also the purpose, the purpose begins to diminish in your life. Just using again, very personal example. This is what happened in my brother's life. He lost all purpose for living and was very candid Last time he talked with Nancy, he was very candid. Nancy, I have no reason to want to live. Betty's gone. She died suddenly. Betty's gone. I can't walk. I can't eat. I have no purpose for life. And no matter what you say, that becomes the reality. The last time I went to see him, spent time with him, it was the same thing. I'm ready to go, don't want to stay. I'm just ready to go. Now, whether that's right or wrong, I can't judge. Whether that's right or wrong. But I do know this, when you do not exercise your spiritual gifts, when you do not exercise your spiritual abilities, everything is going to run downhill. Everything downhill. 
Now, William Barclay makes a first principle of the Christian life statement that I hope you have in your notes. Uselessness invites disaster. Uselessness invites disaster. Now, let's pick up in chapter 15, beginning with verse 12. That's where we are scheduled to start this morning. Chapter 15, beginning with verse 12. Now, as John continues talking about this idea of growth and grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ and the love of God that's in Jesus Christ, listen to what he says, beginning with verse 12. This is my commandment. Now, if you're an underscorer, underscore the word commandment. Uh, He means business. Uh, This is not a, I want you to. This is not a, would you consider it? This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. For his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, I will call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does, but I have called you Friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Uh, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask in in my Father's name, he may give to you. These things... I command you that you love one another. Now, I rather suspect that Jesus has come to the place in talking to these disciples that he realizes they don't have much, much, much more time. Time is running short. Whatever he's going to say to them, he needs to say to them succinctly. Now, I mentioned to you that one of our class members found a a good resource for the Gospel of John that I've come to really appreciate. Now, in this resource, I'm going to give you an outline of 12 through 17. And then we're going to go back and pick pick each part of it apart. An outline, John 15, 12 through 17. This is something you can use in some form, form, a future date. I mean, you might want to be doing a devotional or preaching a sermon or teaching a lesson. Here it is. The supreme command to believers. Verse 12. The supreme command to believers. Verse 12. Love one another. The supreme command to believers. Verse 12, love one another. Number two, the supreme standard of believers. The supreme standard of believers. The love of Jesus Christ becomes the standard. Verse 13. Well, verses 12 and 13, really. Let me say that again. The supreme standard of believers, the love of Jesus Christ, verses 12 and 13. Number three, the supreme bond, B-O-N-D, The supreme bond of believers. Friends in Jesus Christ. Verses 14 and 15. Friends 
in Jesus Christ. Number four, the supreme purpose of believers. The supreme purpose of believers. Chosen and ordained. Verse 16. Verse 16. And then, as normally you do with a sermon or a lesson, you repeat. So number five is, the supreme command is repeated. Love one another. Now, I want all of you to get that in your notes because I really believe that is an outline that you can use to preach to yourself just about every day of your life. We need to know this love one another. Now, let's take that apart and try to put it back together. The supreme command, the supreme command, love one another. Now, let me start with the negative. The lack of love destroys. The lack of love destroys. I don't care what it is. In the family, in the marriage relationship, in church life, the lack of love destroys. It really bothers me when folks say to me, I really love you, brother, but listen, folks, no if and or buts when it comes to love in the church. There just is none. Well, I just like him better than I like him. That's fine. Personalities make a difference in the relationship. But I'm not talking about the personalities that make a difference in the relationship. I'm not talking about the personalities that make a difference in I, I like, I enjoy being with. I'm talking about the basic concept of the believer in Jesus Christ toward the other believer in Jesus Christ is that of love. And if we can't love one another, we have a real problem on our hands. If we look at others with disdain, we look at others with a jaundiced eye, we look at others as, as if they do not matter, that they are garbage in the street. If we look at others in any other way than love, we have missed why Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross to show us how to love one another. So I have to confess to you, I don't understand confusion about love in the church. I don't understand it. Maybe it's because I was fortunate enough, the first church I joined, they loved me. They really did. And they had no right to, they had no reason to love me. I couldn't do anything to help them. I was working for the FBI and Nancy and I had just got married. We were barely making, there was nothing I could do that would help them financially. Uh, I could be a warm body on Sunday morning and that was about it. That was about it. But they loved me and I knew they loved me. I remember the first church I pastored Oh my, I, I, I was so ignorant. Uh, I was just absent. You know, there is one degree beyond ignorance and that I was ignorant. <laughs> I was one degree beyond ignorant. I, I hadn't had no training. I had absolutely no training whatsoever. And this wonderful little church on 27th Avenue off of Indian School Road in Phoenix, Arizona was without a pastor. And they had the audacity 
to invite me to become their pastor. They didn't take me through a course to see how much I knew. If they had, they probably would not have voted. They just simply believed and they loved me. And they loved me. Oh, they loved me so much. They put up with so much. You, you cannot imagine. You cannot imagine. Every, I'd stand at the back door on Sunday morning and the little old ladies would come through and say, Oh, oh, Brother John, you sound so much like Billy Graham. <laughs> and I wanted to say to them that was because it was Billy's sermon that I preached today. <laughs> I had no clue how to put a sermon together. It was just shot in the dark. I finally said to him, you know, you know, I need a study. I said, is there a room that we're not using? And for some reason, they said, yeah, we're not using the men's restroom. <laughs> said, we never have. Doesn't work. I said, we'll move everything out and put me in a desk and a bookcase. They said, preacher, that space is only five by five. I said, well, I only have three books, so it won't matter. <laughs> that was my church. They loved me, and they did. They put me in a little desk, and they even found an air conditioner unit and put in an air conditioner unit so I could go during the day and study. You almost have to have air conditioning in Phoenix, Arizona. So I'd have a place to go to study. They wanted to be sure I had a place to go to study. But I, the, those folks loved me. They loved me until the very day I left that church. In fact, when I resigned from that church, they refused to accept my resignation. So probably I'm still pastor of that church that, does, <laughs> that doesn't exist any longer anyhow, so it doesn't matter. We finally gave it to the Indians. First time we've ever given much back to the Indians. Uh, we gave it to the first Indian Baptist Church of Phoenix, Arizona, because it had dwindled in population and, well, all that story. So what I'm saying is, love is that basic quality of the Christian life. You just ought to love one another. Now, I'm not talking about some kind of molasses, sticky love. I'm talking about reality. I'm talking about reality, that you love because you love. Nothing more, nothing less. I don't love you because of what I can get out of you. I love you because of who you are in Jesus Christ. That is the supreme command of Christ to believers, love one another. Well, if you love one another, you're going to do some things for each other. You're going to have some joy in Christ that you would not otherwise have. I love the passage in Philippians. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. That's what must happen to us. Learn to love one another. I just jotted down, gloomy, high, constant criticism of believers, fellow believers, is absolutely contradiction in terms of the scripture. Now, let me say that again. I might have garbled that some. When there is this constant, gloomy side, highly criticizing, of other believers in Jesus Christ, that is a contradiction in Scripture. Now, does that mean you do everything right? No. Does that mean I do everything right? No. But we love each other even when we don't do everything right. 
Does that mean I do everything you want me to do? No. Does that mean you do everything I want you to do? No. But that is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the love of Christ that he had for us, we ought to have for each other. Go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 sometime. Now, number two, the standard, the love of Jesus. The love of Jesus. Who can separate us from the love of God? What can separate us from the love of God? Paul asked in Romans 8. Nothing can. Nothing can. There are three things that remain, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Now, I, I go back to my pitch. Why is love greater than faith and hope? Why is love greater than faith? No, number one, it's the commandment of God to love one another. That puts it on a whole new plane. But do you realize the only thing you take from this life to the life to come in heaven is love? You don't take hope. Your hope's fulfilled. It's finished. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ in righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground. But love goes to the other side. Love is all about the other side. So, the standard is Jesus Christ. He demonstrates what he wants us to do. Now, number three, the supreme bond, friendship. He's very careful here to point out the difference between being a slave and being a friend. A slave does not know what the owner is going to do. Normally, a friend will discuss what is going to take place. I've jotted down three things. Friendship of Jesus. The friendship of Jesus is demonstrated by I lay down my life for my friends. That's the demonstration of friendship. Now, I don't know how many friends you have, probably not as many as you think. You have a lot of acquaintance and you know a lot of people and you know a lot of people well. And you really like a lot of people. But if I've calculated correctly, in these 65 years that I've been preaching, if I have had as many as 10 friends in all that 65 years, I'd be surprised. I mean who would do what he's talking about here, lay down his life for a friend. Now, I'd have no problem laying down my life for one of my kids. I'd gladly do that. Given the option, I'd want them to live rather than me to live. I'd gladly do that. And I'm not saying that boastfully. I'm, I'm being perfectly honest. I would die for my children. I would die probably for my grandchildren. And my great-grandchildren. But I don't know of very many other people I would die for. To lay down my life for. So he's simply using Jesus and his love as the standard at this point. Lay down my life. That's the demonstration. The friendship of Christ. You are my friends. You are my friends. Only one place since Abraham was called a friend of God. You are my, now Jesus is saying, you are my friends. Now friends, I don't know everything about friendship, but I do know this. I like having friends. Here again, I might have told you this story. It seemed like when we miss a couple of weeks, I forget everything I've told you up to now. I had a friend in Sulphur Springs, Texas. He was a rancher. One of the most unassuming men you'd ever meet. Just, just a good, good man. 
loved his wife, loved his kids. Just a good, good man. I went to be his pastor in 1971. I don't suppose we had been there six months until I realized this man's going to be my friend. He's going to be my friend. He supported me in everything, even when he thought I was wrong. He supported me, and then we worked it out, at, worked it out later. He was just a friend. But when Nancy had her heart attack in Shreveport a number of years back, I was staying right near the ICU unit where she was. And I looked up and I saw someone walking toward me. And the more I looked, the more I understood, that's Johnny Dobson. That's my friend from Sulphur Springs, Texas. That's my friend. So he walked up and I said, Johnny, what are you doing here? Is there someone from Sulphur Springs sick that you've come to see? He said, no. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I came to take you to lunch. That's a five to six hour round trip. I've come to take you to lunch. I know that you've been staying close to this ICU unit. You haven't been eating like you need to. I came to take you to lunch. That's all he said. So he said, get up and let's go. So he took me to lunch. After lunch, let me back out of the hospital, drove back home. Now that's a small thing. That's a small thing. But it also makes a statement of declaration. I'm your friend. I'm your friend. Friends can depend on each other. Friends can depend on each other. You're not going to be betrayed. And you cultivate that friendship. They listen to each other. What we have to say to each other makes a difference. They encourage each other. If you have a friend, encourage your friend. Encourage them. Well, let's stop there and we'll pick up there next time and we'll talk about the, a little bit more about the supreme bond and then the supreme person.